to welcome everyone visiting here for the first time or for a second time or continuously to ICF, International Christian Fellowship in Chisinau. Um, this is a place where we get together and we come from different parts of the world. We also come from this part of the world and we get together here to join together in our international voices to worship God and also to hear what God has from us. So, my name is Eugene. I am part of ICF. I'm happy to welcome you here today. And uh, this is a small crowd. Uh, believe it or not, it does get a little bit small in the summer as people travel, travel back home to visit with friends, relatives, um, and as they take vacations. But this room does get filled up also during other times of the year. And uh, we find this place to be a magnificent, interesting place where we meet people with different walks of lives from different backgrounds. And what I love about this place is that you always find somebody who has a life story of a search. Because you're in Moldova, in a, from a different country, with a purpose. There's a reason. Something started that. Something moved you out of your comfortable zone from your in your home country. And a lot of times you will see God in this. You will see God in that moment. So um, as we spend time worshiping and also at the end of the fellowship, take the time to get to know each other. Get to learn, get to know new people because the beauty in that is that you can see God. You can see God at work and He's always at work. As far as announcements, we get together on Sundays at 4.30 p.m. every Sunday. Prior to that, we have a chance to meet for, for prayer. We also have prayer meetings that happen uh, during the week, on Tuesday mornings, we have a men's coffee prayer meeting at Tucano's. So, men, boys, we always welcome you to come and join us and pray. On Wednesdays at the church office, we have a prayer meeting, and you can participate in person, but also virtually, and you can submit your prayer needs and requests, and we'll pray for you. We also love to hear how God has responded to those prayer requests in that chat. Messenger chat is a great opportunity to do so. And so, I think we are going to continue. Okay. All right. So, we are at ICF in a summer series called Knowing Jesus. And we are looking at Jesus in different angles, at different views, different perspectives. And we began by looking at Jesus as the anointed king, prophet, and priest. We also looked at the fact that he coming to us was both God and man. And that brought some uniqueness to what he could do for us. Last Sunday, Jeff reviewed for us some of those outrageous I am claims that Jesus made to those that he interacted with. And specifically we talked about that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And if you look through those, uh, those statements through the lens of first century Jewish law teachers, those claims were pretty outrageous, I would say. In fact, some of those claims almost got him stoned. Remember when he said, you know, I am one with the Father, and the Jews picked up the stones and wanted to stone him, and he said, for which works do you want to stone me? And they said, you're making yourself one with God, not for any of your good works. That's outrageous. And so, I would say today that Jesus did not just make claims that were outrageous. His actions were also pretty scandalous. And uh, not just what he said, but it was also what he did that I believe brought an outrage among the people of the first century. Let's talk a little bit about scandals. Everybody likes to hear a good scandalous story, right? Scandals always seem to get our attention. Why is that? Because there's always a story with some juicy details, exposing someone, exposing someone's actions, double behavior. We are used to hearing about political scandals. We're used to hear about celebrity scandals. I think those exist. That's how celebrities maintain their fame, by scandals, right? Um, there are also sports scandals. I think recently we've heard about some scandals where some of the athletes uh, were stripped of their gold medals because they were found to be using performance-enhancing drugs. 
And that's a big scandal. Imagine you get a gold medal and then it's taken away from you. A scandal is behavior. It's a kind of behavior that calls or calls out a public outrage. It's shocking. It makes us think a little bit better of ourselves because certainly we would never be like that. We would never do anything like that, don't we? Makes us ask the question, how could they? Part of the reason, as I mentioned, we like to hear those stories is because it makes us feel better than others. And a scandalous behavior is something that's causing an outrage within the public by perceived action or a poor moral behavior. And I submit to you today that Jesus did a lot of that scandalous behavior. From the definition alone, if we look at interpretation, we can conclude that Jesus was scandalous. Would you agree with me? Um, when we perceive, we make a perception, right? And look at what the Jewish leaders perceived Jesus to be doing. He healed on Sabbath, despite being scoffed by the religious leaders. leaders. Jesus ate with outcasts of the society. He ate with tax collectors and sinners. He told parables that made the religious leaders look bad. And he outraged them, and that's essentially why they wanted to kill him. And so today, I want to look at another scandalous story that involves Jesus and a woman. In Jesus' day, a rabbi interacting with a woman was scandalous enough. But this story involves Jesus and a sinful woman. And so we'd like to read today just a few verses from Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. And the title of my sermon is Scandalous Mercy. Then one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to eat with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a sinful woman from that town learned that Jesus was dining there, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair. Then she kissed his feet and anointed them with the perfume. When the Pharisee who invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who this is and what kind of woman is touching him, for she is a sinner. But Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men were debtors to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and another 50. When they were unable to repay him, he forgave them both. Which one then will love him more? I suppose the one who was forgiven more, Simon replied. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. And turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? When I entered your house, you did not give me water for my feet, but she wiped my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me you did not greet me with a kiss, but she has not stopped kissing my feet since I arrived. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore, I tell you, because her many sins have been forgiven, she has loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. But those at the table began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus told the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is God's holy word. So we are reading that then Jesus went to eat with the Pharisee. And uh, the word then here calls for a question. It calls to investigate what is the context of this. When you read in the Bible, then you always want to ask a question, then when? So what were the circumstances? What was the other's intent in the story about this event? Um, I want to clarify something. 
the accounts in the Gospels are not biographies of Jesus Christ. Now, this is also not the account that happened six days before the Passover. This is a different story, I believe. There is something that's called author's context. The Gospels, as the, they're not biographies of Jesus Christ, but they have authors. They are stories. Mark, John, Luke, Matthew, these are authors of Gospels, and they have purposes in telling this story. For example, John 20, 31 tells us that these things, the signs about Jesus, they were written so that people might believe in Jesus, that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, they may have life in his name. So John clearly identifies, I wrote all of this so that you can believe that Jesus is the Christ. And to understand why Luke is showing this story, what he's trying to say, we need to look at the context. So what is the context? The time is still the first part of Jesus' ministry. By this time, he's already cleared the temple during Passover. He had a lengthy discourse with Nicodemus. He also revealed himself as the savior of the world to the Samaritan woman. And he was now back on his way to the northern parts of Israel, to Galilee. So this is the place of the encounter. This is the Galilean surroundings. Some of the cities nearby are Capernaum and Nain. In Capernaum, Jesus healed the servant of centurion. In Nain, he brought back to life the son, the only son of a widow. And so we can see that the circumstances of this event is Jesus' rising popularity. He is healing people, he's bringing people back from dead, he is teaching, he's having confrontations with Jesus, uh, with, with the Pharisees, and his teaching, we can read, is spreading throughout the whole land. He's preaching in synagogues, and he's teaching people as the one who has authority. And so all of that definitely brings up a question. Who is this? And we know that many people have this kind of a question. What kind of a teacher is Jesus? Is he a prophet? Is he a messiah? Is he an imposter? Is he a self-proclaimed messiah? And who could be better equipped to answer this question and investigate than a Pharisee? And so we see here that Simon, who is a Pharisee, is taking a pretty nice approach by inviting this young rabbi into his house and wanting to fellowship with him, listen to him, find out more about who Jesus is. Let's make some observations about this encounter. We have several people here. We've got Simon. Simon, as we already know, is a Pharisee. And uh, a Pharisee is somebody who, at that time, knew well the religious law. And not only did he know it well, he did it well. And so they were the people who were considered to be righteous, zealous followers of God's law. And so he is invi inviting Jesus to dinner for a fellowship. He wants to see for himself, who is this man? People wanted to see Jesus. We read that Herod wanted to see Jesus. Remember the story of Zacchaeus, who climbed the tree because he wanted to see who Jesus was? Luke, um, this chapter, verses 16 through 17, tell us about the reputation of Jesus. It says that a sense of awe swept over all of the people, and they glorified God. And this is what they said. A great prophet has appeared among us. God has visited his people. And so the news about Jesus was spreading throughout the whole land and the whole surrounding region. And so the question on the mind of the Pharisee was, is this true? Is he really the Messiah? And something happens at this encounter in his house that seals his conclusion. And the conclusion is, it's not true. He is not the Messiah. Let's look at the woman in this encounter. Luke says that she was from the same town that the Pharisee was, and he does say that she was a sinful woman. But let's hear how the Pharisee, in his thoughts, describes the woman. After all, he's from the same place that she is. And the Pharisee says, if this man were a prophet, he would know who this is and what kind of woman is touching him, for she is a sinner. By saying who and what kind of a woman, the Pharisee basically says what she has done and who she'd become. 
He knows that. Everybody knows that. For him, her sins framed her identity. And he locked her into one stereotype, she's a sinner. We don't know, I would say, what kind of sin it was, but likely it was a sin of prostitution. But it doesn't have to be the only kind of a sin that creates a label like that, who and what manner the person is. Think about the tax collectors. That's who and what manner their betrayals of the society. You've heard terms like, he's a chronic liar. Not only he lies, he lies all the time. You've heard the terms, a thief, thief, recidivist. Not only does he steal, even after being punished and released back, he continues to steal. And so there are many different sinful behaviors that happen in the lives of people that can earn you a badge or a label. And that woman earned a label from the Pharisee. Most likely this woman was just caught in a cycle of sinful behavior and she just could not get out. However, despite being publicly known for her sins, having learned that Jesus was in the house of the Pharisee, she decides to come and be an attendant and see him. And so let's come back to Simon's verdict. He sees what's happening, he sees that Jesus is doing nothing, and he makes the choice, the decision. This is not a prophet. Simon did not need any further proof. He had seen everything with his own eyes. He gave Jesus a chance to prove himself, and Jesus clearly failed it. Simon was disgusted with the woman that came to his house, and he was not impressed with Jesus. This was a scandalous behavior, wouldn't you call it? And Jesus did nothing about it. If people back then wore bracelets that says WWJD, what would Jesus do? I don't think Simon would say that this is not what Jesus would do. But yet he did. And Simon, we read, got offended. Simon was offended by the fact that Jesus, being a rabbi, a teacher, claiming to be a prophet or even a messiah, he allowed a sinful woman to touch him. But that's exactly, that is exactly what Jesus warned earlier about himself, other people. He says, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Simon just could not accept that a true prophet can be approached by sinful people like that. If he were a prophet, he thought he would know this person and what further he implied that he would not let her touch him like that. Jesus did not meet the expectations for a prophet, moreover for a messiah. But he was badly mistaken. Simon was truly mistaken, as we understand. And I wonder, do we, mistakes, do we make mistakes like that in our lives sometimes? Do we truly believe that Jesus is for sinners? You know, there's a saying, fool me once, shame on me. I'm, I'm sorry, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Meaning, once is okay, but a second time should never happen. And do we sometimes apply that to our lives? Once to sin is okay, but a second time to sin? That is not acceptable. Having been caught in a cycle of sinful behavior, do we sometimes just dare not touch Jesus? Approach Him? Let me ask you, having been stuck in sin, do we first try to get our act together, pull ourselves by the bootstraps, clean our act so that we can be found worthy of Jesus' presence? And how do we do that? We deprive ourselves of fellowship with God, thinking that we're unworthy. We put ourselves on a notice after notice, one more time, and, and what? Only wait for enough time to pass before we can come to God. We want to spend enough time getting what we deserve, suffer enough, pay in full, teach ourselves a lesson. 
years ago when I was still a teenager, I loved this song by by uh, <clears throat> Steve Taylor, a song that's called Just As I Am. And you can see the words on the screen. It says, Just as I am, I am stiff-necked and proud. Jesus is for losers. Why do I still play for the crowd? Just as I am, pass the compass, please. Jesus is for losers. And I'm off about 100 degrees. Do you find yourself in a place in life like that sometimes? That you think Jesus is not for losers like me. But this story proves exactly the opposite, is that Jesus is for losers. If we do this, it means we don't understand God's scandalous grace and mercy, which opened up direct access, unlimited access to God for all kinds of and all manner of sinners. And in doing so, we not only don't understand, but we also reject God's purpose for our lives. And that is a far more serious offense. And that's what Simon did. And that's what it says in the Bible, that he rejected, along with all other Pharisees, God's purpose for himself. Earlier in the chapter, Jesus talks about John the Baptist. We talked about him just a few weeks ago. That he was a prophet, a great prophet, such a great prophet that nobody who was born before him is greater than John is. John is greater than Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel. He is greater than all of these prophets. But in the same breath, Jesus says, but the least in God's kingdom is greater than John. How do you understand this kind of a statement? The way I think you understand this is that John is greatest in terms of what he did for God because he came to prepare the way for the Messiah, to prepare the people for the Messiah. But the way he is the least, meaning that the least person in God's kingdom is greater than John, is because of what God does for the people. The story of the sinful woman is that powerful example of what God now does for the people. The compassion, the mercy that he shows to the human beings. Unfortunately, as the story goes, Simon rejected the will of God for himself. And his story is an example of what happens when we reject God's will and God's grace for us. The Pharisees, it says, they rejected God's purpose for themselves. That happened in the context of John's baptism, the baptism for the repentance from all sins. Jesus acknowledged the work of John. The angel announcing his birth said that he will make the people ready. But ready for what? His father, as the Christ prophecy says, and pulls the curtain, he will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. This knowledge of salvation through forgiveness of sins is what distinguished this woman from the Pharisee. You see, Simon wanted to see Jesus because he had doubts about who he was. But the woman came to his house to see Jesus because she realized who he was, the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. The Pharisee counted on his own righteousness, but the woman counted on God's mercy. The Pharisee counted on what he did for God, but the woman counted on what God did for her. Sounds familiar? Remember the story of a tax collector and the Pharisee praying? And Jesus says, I tell you, this tax collector who just beat his chest saying, Lord, have mercy on me, he is the one that went home justified, not the Pharisee who had all of his acts of righteousness. And right there, we can see who got it right and who got it wrong. And Jesus, in front of Simon in his house, he saw that the woman got it right. He already saw the undeniable proof that she understood what God has done for her. And that's why he begins to just help Simon see the truth for himself by telling him this story of two people who owed some money to a money lender. 
And so the question, we read the story, the question we ask is, which of these two people do you think will love him more? Simon confesses, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. Makes sense. Simon is cornered. That's the truth. And then look at what happens next. The Bible says that Jesus, turning toward the woman, says to Simon. He's looking at the woman, but he's talking to Simon. And he says to Simon, do you see this woman? Let me ask you again. What did Simon see before? He saw a disgraced sinner. He saw a label. He saw a stereotype. He saw an outcast. But he did not see her as a person for who she was. Nor did he recognize what she did, that it was a great act of worship. But Jesus missed absolutely nothing in that encounter. He recognized her. He saw her as a person. He saw her sorted past. He saw her humble present. And he saw her glorious future. And he accepted that worship. And so the Lord's response to Simon tells him about what happens. And he tells her, the reality is that therefore I tell you, because her sins are many and they have been forgiven, she loves him much. Let me ask you, when do you think the forgiveness happened of her sins? Was it before she came to see Jesus or was it after she poured the oil on Jesus at that meeting or at that place? Remember the story again, Jesus says, the tax collector went home more justified. Jesus was not even there to tell him, your sins are forgiven. He already went home justified. Do you think the woman planned that night, okay, Jesus is in the house of Simon the Pharisee. I'm going to grab some very costly perfume. I'm going to weep. I'm going to wet his feet with my tears. And I drop to my knees, wipe his feet with my hair, and then anoint his feet with the costly perfume. Do you think she planned to do that? I don't think so. I don't believe it. I believe all of this was a spontaneous act of worship. And that was the result of the secret hero in this story, John the Baptist. That's what John the Baptist achieved in the heart of this woman. She realized that she's a sinner and that she needs salvation and she saw the Savior and she came to worship the Savior. What she did was an act of a response to the love that she saw and believed that she receives from God. Surely those were the tears of regret for her sins, but I think there were more the tears of gratitude and joy in proportion to the love that God had poured out on Jesus poured out on her for the sins that he is going to take on himself. And so I want to address just for a brief moment those of us here today who are dealing with sin in their lives. And if you're in the room and you're breathing, that includes you. All of us have sins to deal with in our lives. And I want to say that the Bible says today that God's will for us is not to suffer, not to do penance, but to simply come to Jesus and repent and receive His scandalous grace and mercy. You've heard that before, but hear this again. There are no probationary periods to come back to God after sin. There's no prolonged remorse that's needed or required. There's no self-punishment. No self-blame, no striving to measure up on your own. All of this leads to becoming a Simon, the Pharisee. But hear instead the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. The Lord is coming to you. Just prepare your heart. He is coming to forgive, to cleanse your sins, to save. Many of us have become followers of God and were forgiven. But think about this way. Have you ever seen a house without a trash bin? Even when a house is built and finished, we still have trash outside to take it out. The garbage truck keeps coming to take the trash out. And for some reason, it always does at 4 a.m. in the morning, but it keeps coming. 
what would you think about a house that was perfect and tidy without any trash being attached to it? You think something's not right about it. What are you doing with all of that? Is it in your home? Is it stinking up? But we diligently, in our daily lives, roll out the trash cans, trash bins, for the garbage truck to come, pick it up, and take it out. Because that's what happens in life. And if we forget or miss the garbage day, we wait until next week, but we need to get it out. Otherwise, it's just going to stink up the place. But we have these services in our home. And I want to say, look at John the Baptist. Look at what he says just earlier on. He basically says to the people, come and repent. Bring all of your sins. Here's the trash pile. Take all of your corrupt thoughts, your stinking deeds, your treacherous betrayals, your recidivist nature, and dump them into this pile of trash right here. And then he begins, and in the same sentence, points a little bit further away and says, Behold the garbage truck. Excuse me the comparison, but behold the Lamb of God who comes and takes away this pile from you. The garbage truck is here. He is ready to take to remove all filthiness from our lives. And he's ready to do this repeatedly. You just need to take it out. You just need to bring it back. So ask yourself, let's ask ourselves, what kind of burdens, sinful burdens, are we carrying in our lives? Today the offer is to live justified, like that woman, like the tax collector, to live justified and go in peace. Jesus is offering this to you. If you think in your heart, Eugene, you don't know my story, it's complicated, it's not that easy, then again, you risk rejecting the will of God for yourself like Simon did. What if this is a hundreds or thousands time that I've done this? Jesus has already forgiven you this much before, and he's willing to forgive more because he wants you to be with him. I'm not saying that we should sin carelessly. God does love us, and he loves us with care and concern for our lives. But today, I want to say that this encounter with the woman proves the compassionate nature of Jesus, not just to heal our physical ailments, not just to bring prosperity in our lives. His compassion extends to us exactly in the very deep places where we need it, in the place of our salvation, in the place of our righteous living. He's compassionate and willing. The offer today is to go home in peace. I'm very happy and I'm glad to see everyone who's come today or everyone who maybe is watching this on YouTube. Today the offer on the table is to go home in peace. Will you take it?